the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Japan's Air Power. our most powerful jet fighter planes were sent to Japan by submarine. That is your answer. That's what a captured Nazi colonel says about Japanese air power. It would be childish for you to assume, Mr. Haynes, that because you Americans are no longer meeting strong opposition in the air over Japan, that you have destroyed the Japanese air force. Uh, you think, Colonel Friedrich, that the Japanese still have a strong air force? And that they will bring it out when the Allied invasion comes? Mr. Haynes, I am a prisoner, not a prophet. American flyers coming back from sweeps over Japan tell of waning opposition. We roamed all over the target without spotting one Japanese plane. We couldn't find any Japanese planes, so we shot up six airfields around Tokyo in one day. We circled for an hour over three airfields and didn't see one Japanese plane. And yet, Mr. Suzuki says something very significant. Airframes are the key to victory. Then where are the Japanese air forces, Colonel? You Americans will know soon enough. Well, you ought to know, Colonel. You visited Japan in the winter and spring of 1944, didn't you? German aviation experts have been visiting Japan for more than 20 years. That's so. The Japanese brought Dr. Vogt and Franz Schneider to Japan after they had tried instructors of half a dozen other nations, France, England, Italy. And since that time... Germany has had more influence on Japanese aviation than any other nation on Earth. After the Japanese invaded Manchuria in 1931, they named pro-German General Yamashita as the first Japanese Inspector General of Army Aviation. And General Yamashita, who later was to be the conqueror of Malaya and Bataan, went to Germany to study the Luftwaffe and to observe the operations of the Luftwaffe against Britain. This will be a very valuable experience for my officers. Yes, sir, General Yamashita. Your observers will fly along in all of the command planes. And what is the target to be for tonight? Coventry, sir. They got their experience firsthand. After they went back, a flood of German aviation experts and technicians went to Japan and the Japanese put what they had learned into practice. December 7, 1941. One U.S. battleship was sunk, another was capsized. Several cruisers were damaged, three destroyers were sunk, and perhaps one submarine was sunk in the Japanese attack early today at Pearl Harbor. December 8, 1941, all but three flying fortresses of the 19th U.S. Bombardment Group at Clark Field, 50 miles northwest of Manila, were destroyed at noon today by a tremendous formation of Japanese bombers. December 10, 1941, the 35,000-ton British battleship Prince of Wales and the 32,000-ton battlecruiser Repulse were sunk by Japanese torpedo planes off the east coast of Malaya just after noon today. Within a few days, the Japanese air forces had almost knocked out the air power of both the United States and the Britain in the Pacific. The Japanese had used 105 planes in the attack of Pearl Harbor, 
They had used 52 in the attack on Clark Field in the Philippines. They had used 43 in the sinking of the Prince of Wales in the Repulse. For nearly six years, the Japanese won everywhere. And then, in the space of a very few months, the Japanese air power suffered its first great defeats, and the face of air operations in the Pacific was changed. April 18th, Doolittle raids Tokyo and B-25s flown from aircraft carrier. May, 4th to 8th, Japanese smashed in the Battle of the Coral Sea. June 3rd to 6th, Japanese crushed in the Battle of Midway. On the first day of the Battle of Midway, the Japanese also attacked Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians. Hey, look at that, sir. Where, Sergeant? That fighter. Looks like it's trying to land. Yes, must be disabled. Doesn't look as if it's out of control. That's one of those zeros, isn't it, sir? I think it is. Look, he's coming right down over there in the muskeg squad. Probably thinks it's a field. There he goes. Can you see him, sir? No, he's out of sight. He must have gone right down to that muskeg. Here comes another flight of bombers. Now, let's get him. Yes, sir. Days later, the Zero fighter that had come down in the muskeg swamp was found. Uh, Captain, what condition was that Zero in? It was an excellent condition. Uh-huh. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, just as we figured, the pilot must have thought he was going to land on solid ground. Instead, the second his wheels hit the muskeg, they sank in and the Zero flipped over in a somersault. It broke the pilot's neck, killed him. But the plane landed on the soft, mushy muskeg and wasn't damaged at all. Thanks, Captain. That was one of the luckiest breaks we got in those early days of the war. The Zero was crated and sent to San Diego. Well, that motor sounds perfect. It's in first-class running condition, sir. Think you can fly it, Lieutenant? I think so, sir. It looks like a remarkable plane. It is. It weighs only 5,200 pounds, fully loaded. Our new F-4Us weigh twice that much. Doesn't have the armor that our planes have. No, sir. Nor as much power. And look at this. There isn't one extra rivet in it. And notice the landing gear. Well, the wheels are 12 feet apart. Yes. Just about the only way it could turn over was the way it did. Somersault. And look at this. The guns are set flush with the wings. Hmm. A cannon in each wing, eh? Yes, sir. And two machine guns that fire through the propeller. Probably over guns for a plane as light as this. Probably. And you see, the wings from the fuselage are made in one piece, not separately as ours are. Well, are you ready to take it up? Yes, sir. Good luck to you, Lieutenant. The Lieutenant, an average-sized American, had trouble squeezing into the undersized seat. He gunned her. And that first Japanese Zero, to be flown by an American, sped down the runway and took the air. The lieutenant made out his report. At 200, it's light on the controls. At 225, the controls are stiff and it'll not make a fast roll. In a dive hitting 380, it flutters and vibrates. The plane was examined minutely. Every detail noted and studied. The Zero engine is really made up of parts copied from many makes of American engines. The adjustable pitch propeller is almost identical with one of our standard propellers. The airspeed indicator, the fuel indicator... And the oxygen regulators are all copies of American design. They examined and tested the guns of the Zero. The machine guns shoot tracer bullets. With these, the pilot draws a bead on his target. When he's on it, he opens up with the two 22-millimeter uh, cannon in the wing. To compare the Zero with American equipment, it was sent up against the Navy F-4U Vought Corsair. It's a fast and highly maneuverable plane. There's no doubt about that, Mr. Hayes. Uh-huh. Uh, how do you think it stacks up against our F-4Us? Well, the answer to that is our record against zeros. We've shot down about five to one. This was 1942. The U.S. was learning about Japanese air power and learning it fast. But the Japanese were learning about us, too, and about production. With the help of German technicians, they raised their production to about 1,000 planes a month. They introduced new research, new production methods, and their production mounted. But American experts kept close tab on what the Japanese were doing. Yes, Japanese research is good, but it's not as good as ours. Is that because of their tendency to copy? Not entirely. They're experts at copying, that's true. 
Sometimes when they copy a piece of American equipment, they even copy the American insignia and our serial number. But basically, their research is not as sound as ours. The center of their aeronautical research is at the Imperial University in Tokyo, where they have all the facilities for research. But they've not yet come up with a good self-sealing fuel tank. And the Japanese had other problems. They don't have enough aluminum. That's important. To begin with, they don't have enough high-grade bauxite, which is the source of aluminum. Besides that, because they don't have enough copper, they've got to use aluminum in many places as a substitute for copper. Another thing, it takes a good deal of electrical power to produce aluminum, and the Japanese haven't got it to spare. And on the production side, there's another angle. Machine tools. You've got to have steel machine tools to turn out airplanes. Until a few years before the war, Japan imported a great part of her machine tools. Now she's making her own, but she can neither make them as well nor as many of them as she needs. By the middle of August, 1942, the picture of air operations in the Pacific was rapidly changing. General Quarters! General Quarters! General Quarters! General Quarters! General Quarters. General Quarters. They're coming back again. If they don't want us here in the settlement. Skip the lab. Get on that gun. This is for you, Tojo. You got him. You got him. He's going in the drink. Keep that ammunition coming. I'll give it to you and you pour it in on him. Come and get it, Tojo. Is that guy ever going to drop? How much can it take? He's diving straight for us. He's coming straight down on us. This is for you, Tojo. Look out for him, Joe. Look out, he's got a crash on this seat. They started it in 1942 in the Solomons, diving their planes into ships. It was a preview of what kind of air war they were going to fight. And day by day, they revealed what they had and how they intended to use it. Squadron of Tojo's approaching. We identified all Japanese fighters with boys' names. Here comes a flock of Bettys. And all Japanese bombers with girls' names. Uh, how do you identify that bomber as a Betty? It's one of the most popular Japanese bombers. It's like our light bombers, B-25s and B-26s. It's long range and a fairly fast ship. Uh-huh. And about Tojo? Tojo is a Japanese army fighting plane. It has four machine guns. It's armored, it's stronger than some of the other fighters, but it's less maneuverable. While the war was being carried closer and closer to Japan, the Japanese airplane production centers hummed night and day. New army planes rolled off the assembly lines and made their way to the combat zones. That's the Dynamark II. It's a twin-engine army fighter. What about its performance? Spectacular. It carries a crew of two, and it climbs to 10,000 feet in a little better than three minutes. Uh-huh. And, uh, what's that? That's a Tony. Seems to have an inline motor. It has. Liquid-cooled. Does about 360 miles an hour. Mm. Not as fast as the top U.S. planes, is it? No, but that's only one factor. Take that plane there. That's the Oscar II. Yes. That army fighter climbs 3,300 feet a minute. Those are some of the army fighters. Then there are the army bombers. Sally is a good deal like Betty. They're both comparable to the American light bombers. And they also have an army light bomber named Helen sometimes used by the Navy as a torpedo bomber. But most of the fighting in the Pacific has been against Navy planes. Our Navy planes are world famous. This is Admiral Yamamoto. It was our Navy planes that destroyed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. It was our Navy planes that destroyed the American air power in the Philippines. And it was our Navy planes that sunk the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. <laughs> Admiral Yamamoto, it was you who developed Japanese naval aviation into such a powerful weapon before the war, wasn't it? It was. And as I remember, it was you who foresaw the potential destructive power of aircraft carriers. The supremacy of air power over naval power should have been obvious to everyone. Admiral Yamamoto organized Japanese naval air power accordingly. The naval air service will consist of three branches. First and most important, carrier aviation. Second, auxiliary carriers. Third, seaplane carriers. Let's take a closer look at some of these ships. That's a Japanese seaplane carrier right there, the Kamoi. 
I see they don't have a flight deck. No. You see, they're hoisting that seaplane over the side, down into the water. Oh, yes. Seaplane carriers like this are especially suitable to Japanese naval aviation. So that they can take the seaplanes to where they're needed? Well, not only that, they are repair shops for seaplanes. Most of the planes used against the Chinese coast cities and river cities are serviced and supplied by seaplane carriers like this one. I see. And besides being a mother ship, these seaplane tenders carry disassembled planes in their holds. As they need them, they assemble them and put them into service. Uh, how many of these ships did Japan have at the outbreak of the war? Five. Well, look at that seaplane take off. Second day, we will have auxiliary carriers. How many auxiliary carriers Yamamoto had at the outbreak of the war is not known. But first and most important, the main combat arm of the fleet will be aircraft carriers with fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. At the outbreak of the war, the Japanese probably had 11 aircraft carriers with several more buildings. Oh, this is the Akagi. This vessel carries up to 60 combat planes. Step back, please. That torpedo bomber is taking off. The Japanese had at least two carriers of the Akagi class at the outbreak of the war, each carrying about 60 planes. Against this, the U.S. had two carriers of the Lexington class, each carrying 80 planes. In addition, our other carriers carry up to 40 planes each. Careful, please. Against the 11 and possibly more Japanese carriers, the U.S. at the outbreak of the war had six carriers, the smallest of which carried 76 planes. So, while the Japanese at that stage had more aircraft carriers... The number of carrier-borne planes in the U.S. Navy and in the Japanese Navy were not far apart. I will write history with my naval aviation. And Yomamoto did, especially with torpedo bombers. The United States has no plane to compare with this one. That's the Japanese Betty 22 medium bomber. It's 30 miles an hour faster than our B-25 Mitchell. Look at that baby go. Uh, watch its speed. About 330 miles per hour. Uh-huh. Carries about 1,600 pounds of bombs. And it's armed with two cannons and three machine guns. Well, that one's passing there. That's the Nell 22. Has a ceiling of 24,800 feet. With a load of 2,200 pounds. Looks like it's got plenty of authority. Well, that's the kind the Japanese used to sink the Prince of Wales in the Republic. Yamamoto put his chips on torpedo bombers. His influence carried on even after his death. And more and different naval aircraft rolled off the Japanese assembly line. Uh, we call this plane the Ginka, or the Milky Way. It is a high-performance, heavily-armed torpedo bomber. We call this one Francis II. And this is our new 10,000-pound torpedo bomber. It is faster than the American Avenger. We call this one Jill. What naval patrol bomber has the U.S. to compare with that ship there? We call this one Emily. That ship flies 96 miles an hour faster than your naval patrol bomber of the same class. The Emily is a four-engine flying boat. It has a range of 4,100 miles and a loaded weight of 68,000 pounds. Until you can produce a plane superior to this one, there can hardly be much sense in saying that we have no originality. best known of all Japanese planes is the Zero, or Zeke, as it is known in the U.S. Army Code. While the early models developed first in 1940 were in combat, newer, improved models were turned out. As the Zeke that came down in the Aleutians was studied, some other Zekes reconstructed from parts of many Zekes were assembled, flown, and also studied. And from these, as well as from the experience of meeting them in combat, we learned about Zekes. these Zeke's both from land and from aircraft carriers. I met one over the... These Zeke's are killers. Don't kid yourself. They're fast and they're maneuverable. 
I remember the one I met. There are lots of different versions of the Zeke, and they're getting better all the time. The last one I... There is a narrow wing Zeke and a wide wing Zeke. Those that carry the detachable belly tanks have a range of about 1,500 miles. The new Zeke 52 has a speed of about 375 miles per hour, climbs about 2,800 feet a minute, and has even higher velocity guns than the earlier Zekes. But there are now several Japanese fighters hotter than the Zeke. Uh, how fast are they, Lieutenant? Well, the Frank 1 does more than 400 miles an hour and has a range of about 1,700 miles. And the Jack 2 also does about 400. And that's plenty. In the space of less than four years, Japanese aircraft have changed enormously. Today, Japanese planes are bigger, faster, more heavily armed. But meantime, another important factor has changed. Personnel. Most of the good Japanese pilots are dead. This fellow has fought them. We found out in China that they were not only good flyers, but they were fearless. Fact is, in some ways, they headed over us. They're smaller, and they're better able to operate in the cramped quarters of a cockpit than a lot of our bigger men. But in a pinch, they're not as good as our men. The unexpected throws them. And that's when it's the difference between winning and losing. But they're pretty good acrobatic flyers, aren't they, Captain? Very good. But that isn't enough to save them when the chips are down. There used to be four enlisted men as pilots to every officer pilot in a Japanese squadron. We would concentrate on the officers. And when the officers were knocked down, the enlisted men, most of the time, didn't know what to do. To meet this situation, the Japanese are now handpicking their flying personnel. Cadets are selected by the Army and Navy when they are very young. These young men will be the flyers who will throw the Americans back into the sea. How old are these boys? They are 15, uh, some of them 16. And what kind of training are you giving them now? They are given preliminary training uh, as pilots, uh, navigators, bombardiers, gunners, and maintenance experts. And they were all chosen for their mental and physical qualities to carry out their mission. Not only are these young flyers prepared as airmen in the ordinary sense, but also in another sense. The pattern has been set. By carrying out a suicidal crush against our objectives, shall we not sink a battleship with a single plane? And shall we not force down a plane carrying ten men with a single plane? The pattern was defense. A last-ditch defense of despair. The Japanese had lost the initiative. Their task now was to stop the on-surging Americans and British. Japan's entire naval air force has now been converted into a special attack corps. If this kamikaze tactic is successful, then victory is assured for Japan. If it is not successful, then the Imperial Japanese Navy will have many heroes for our shrine. Members of the Kamikaze Corps are well trained for their missions. I have completed my preparation. This volunteer, 20 years old, has been trained as a pilot, then given a six month course in the piloting of the Jin Rai flying bomb or Baka bomb. I offer my life to the Emperor. Before he takes off on the mission, which will bring him certain death, he is fated and honored. is for you. Food and drink and geisha girls. I am grateful. Feast yourself and may every minute be filled with happiness. I am honored. When the festival is over, the kamikaze pilot's head is shaved, his face painted white, his body clothed in a ceremonial robe. He is ready for his mission. You see, as he walks with his arms across his body, all people bow in reverence to him. May your journey be happy. I am unworthy of your homage. Go get him, you guys. I hope our fighters get up there before those baka bombs get here. Oh, our side bombers have been plastering their baka bomb bases so long, I don't see how there can be any left. There is, bud. There is. 
Here they come. Here they come. Hey, look at that. Those suicide planes are hung right under those big planes. Hey, that one up there's cutting loose from the big plane. Looks like a flying torpedo. Here she comes. Look at the smoke shoot out of the tail. That's what it is. A rocket plane. It's diving straight for us. Get it, you guys up there. Get it. It's going to miss us. No, it's turning right for us. Look out. Look out. Look out. Look out. the Kamikaze Corps, today may direct hit our major units of the United States Navy at Okinawa. The Kamikaze Corps has now sunk or damaged more than 500 enemy vessels in the Okinawa operation, and there is evidence that... The suicide planes came over in a swarm. Six of the Barker bombs, each with a human pilot, were shot down by the aircraft carrier, but the seventh broke through and struck the island, exploding and tearing great holes in the bulkheads and knocking down... The measure of the effectiveness of the Baca bombs is reflected in the official statement of the United States government. Working continuously under the concentrated air effort of the enemy, the fleet suffers daily damage. The extent of the damage is revealed in an official U.S. report. From March 18th to May 29th, the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard losses at Okinawa were 4,729 men killed or missing. In terms of air power, the Okinawa campaign represented a determined effort by the Japanese to stop the Americans. Yes, the Japanese sank 30 American vessels and damaged 44 others. But the U.S. Navy knocked down 3,700 Japanese planes. 3,700 Japanese planes. And that does not include the Japanese planes shot down by U.S. Army planes or by shore-based anti-aircraft fire. The Japanese suffered their greatest air defeat of the war at Okinawa. <laughs> From the days of Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese could get away with a sneak attack, and from the days of Guadalcanal, when the Japanese first used aerial suicide tactics, Japanese air power has gone through a great transition. Today, Japanese warplanes are being destroyed wherever they are found, and Japanese warplane production centers are being systematically wiped from the face of the earth. The Japanese today probably have about 4,000 planes in combat. Against that, the U.S. Navy Air Force alone has 37,000 combat planes, without including U.S. Army planes. And uh, what would you say the Japanese losses are? Since Pearl Harbor, Navy and Marine pilots alone have shot down 17,000 Japanese planes, while we've lost only 2,700, a ratio of more than six to one. And to this, Mr. Suzuki makes an astute observation. Airplanes are the key to victory. In fighting America, we are not fighting a people. We are fighting a machine. But we are men. And the spirit of man will triumph over the machine. And to this, Colonel Friedrich, erstwhile Nazi instructor of the Japanese, adds a footnote. The blueprints to our most powerful jet fighter plane are now in the hands of the Japanese. Wait until you Americans meet that plane. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Eddie Marr. 
This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.